so welcome back today is our lab session of week 6 the topic of this week were, was generative adversarial networks in the theory session on monday we covered two kinds of uh, gans uh, first we covered the classic gan uh, described in the original paper of 2014 literally with the name generative adversarial networks and the second thing that we did uh, was something called dc gan the dc gan brought about a sort of the same kind of vector uh, vector arithmetic um, in the space of images as we have in the space of words in words we have word to vec if you remember word embeddings whether we have glove or word to vec or word contextual embeddings elmo and so on and so forth the end result of all of that is words can be represented uh, as vectors either context free or contextually in the in the world of images the surprising thing is uh, people didn't expect that images could be represented as contextual as vectors and sure enough the dc gan opened the doors to that there are many many gans that we didn't talk about i have on my shelf a book here called gans in action it's a uh, i mean it's a i mean i have a pre production copy i believe which i printed out because of my uh, licensing from manning very good uh, very nice and i think it where is my printed copy or has it not yet come out i'll have to see i would encourage you it's a good book uh, it's a good book and if you want to pursue that certainly please pursue that now uh oh, asit book name gans in action actually let me show you guys the book let's go to amazon and see the book uh, or a go to manning if you go to manning.com um let me sign in so manning is the publisher of the book if you sign in you will let me give you an idea of that it's logging me in so somewhere in here is gan in action this is a lovely book actually i like it very much <clears throat> and uh, if you look in the introduction to gans generative models and so on and so forth it's actually now it is published so it's a very good book uh, you may consider buying it it's available uh, these days as you know there's a lot of sale going on one way to purchase manning books is to just uh, look for coupons uh, sooner or later you'll be lucky and you'll get a 40% or a 50% discount coupon and uh, then you'll get both the printed copy the ebook and the and everything the live book and everything all sorts of versions of the books become available and if you have a account with dropbox as i have i find it rather convenient as this books uh, you purchase even before they are published as the chapters keep coming they keep showing up in the dropbox account and so they keep showing up on your uh, ipad and so forth and your cell phone whatever it is i usually use my ipad pro for it it begins to show up there so uh, that's sort of a convenience thing and it's also obviously available in amazon uh, so you can see that there is a book dedicated to it uh in action so how we relevant it is right uh, i think this is a good one it is a good book it's a good book it's a easy read though like it's a, but it is really worth it uh, see all of these books are uh, how should i say it uh, <clears throat> gans are gans there are so many gans out there right just having a book that you can quickly refer to is worth the 30 30 actually when you get it with coupon and all that you'll get it for 25 dollars it's certainly worth it So today I'm going to do something uh, interesting. Uh, I want to show you the power of GANs in a very direct way. So we have here GANs. Uh, I don't know. Did any one of you watch this video by uh, Ali Gortsi? If you haven't watched that video, I would encourage. Is there anybody here who who has watched it? Please speak up. Started, but not completed that. Yeah, how did you like it so far? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like the reading. Yeah. He is one of the people who explains slowly and very clearly. Uh, is known for his explanation. 
Now, there are a few medium articles that I've put. Now, this is one thing that I, so first of all, if you want to see the PyTorch, various implementations of GAN in PyTorch, there is a dedicated uh, GitHub, which shows quite literally that PyTorch GAN, and this library, PyTorch GAN, contains implementations of all this long list of GANs. And just looking at it, you realize that this is how much activity is happening in this field, that simply the list of GANs is so long. And so of these, I taught you only the classic one and the DC GAN. When we are doing, con when we are doing image processing, we'll come back and do a few more, <laughs> three, four more GANs we will cover at that time, important ones, the latest uh, breakthroughs that are happening, uh, we are going to cover. So that is one thing. The other thing I wanted to show you is uh, a fun stuff. Hang on, let me search again for GAN. Yeah. So is this, and let's start by looking at this for a moment. If you're used to TensorFlow Playground, this is very similar to that. What we will do is, Remember, what do GANs do? They <clears throat> imagine that the data is like real currency. The, the generator is like the thief, the, 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 the person who is going to counterfeit it. And he cannot see the data. The thief cannot see the data. And yet, even without seeing the data in due course of time, the thief figures out what the actual data looks like. Okay? It's the most remarkable thing. Imagine a counterfeiter. <laughs> who has never seen a dollar bill, but who only knows what the cop is saying. Uh, is this a dollar or not? Is this a valid dollar or counterfeit? And based on what the uh, police is using to distinguish between the two, just looking at how many mistakes the police is making, it sort of learns, learns what the dollar is. The whole idea is quite remarkable. <coughs> so we are going to do, let's, let's do this little experiment here. So let me go here. So you look at these data sets. You see this data? So suppose data is in a circle or maybe something simple. Imagine that the data is in a straight line. Right? Let us see how long it takes the GAN to figure it out. So I want you to pay attention at two places. Do you see the fake here, box of fake? This shows what the generator is producing. The real data, so at any given moment, the discriminator will get a bunch of samples from the real and a bunch of samples from the fake. Do we remember that guys from the, uh, from the Monday session? Yeah. So, and the discriminator yeah. has to decide, is it real or fake? And then it has to propagate the gradients back for the real and for the fake, it has to propagate the gradients this way. So let's do that. Let's run this and see what happens. Do you see the decision boundary between fake and real is uh, going on, is changing? How? And now it is drawing, it is making points here. The fake is, so if you look at it, the fake is, would you say that the fake is already coming, beginning to figure out, the thief is beginning to figure out what the data should look like. And you see this little, um, I don't know if you can see the hair growing uh, from the bottom of the uh, purple dots or the pink dots. Do you see those little lines? Yes. That is the direction of the gradient descent. So if you, if you look at those lines carefully, uh, they are tilting these data points towards this line. Can you see that? Towards the actual green points. So let's see what happens if we go a few more steps. Do you notice how much closer it is now? It is making big gradients. You know, it's, those, uh, it's figured out that there is a big arrow pointing towards this data. Let's run a few more epochs. Now, do you see it is uh, zooming in towards it? And you can see the decision boundary change. At this moment, the decision boundary is still wrong, but it's getting there. Keep looking at the background green and purple also. So at this moment, what do you think, guys? It is getting pretty close, isn't it? Yep, definitely. Yes, and let's see how further, how much further it goes. 
uh, if you run it for a few thousand uh, epochs more. And look at the fake it is drawing. You see the, the fake and the real? They're beginning to, at least to the casual viewer, it's beginning to look fairly accurate, isn't it? It could have fooled you except at the bottom where it's a bit harder. <coughs> and this is when you're training the model from scratch. It, it takes a few thousand epochs. It will move and gradually stretch and do things. Uh, Asif, yes. Uh, what's the discriminator doing here in the meantime? Discriminator is just telling if a data point is fake, is it is it green or purple? Okay. Because the discriminator is not told that, right? Yeah. So it is, whenever it's given a fake data, it's told that it's actually real data. Okay. Right? So the generator is trying to fool the discriminator. The thief passes on a data point or a currency and says this is real. Is the job of the police to say no, this is not real? Okay. So now you see that it has sort of gotten stuck in a place at which it cannot bounce <clears throat> out of. And that shows that when you train these GANs, sometimes they can be a little bit uh, un like, you know, they can get caught up in a situation from which they don't easily recover. Now, one more thing, if you look at it, do you notice the discriminant loss and the generative loss are very close to each other now, right? And if you keep looking at this, you'll see that something quite interesting, the, <clears throat> the, the symmetric KL divergence, but the KL divergence is, I didn't explain what KL divergence is. Uh, I did that in the math class, but not here. So KL divergence basically tells you how different is one probability or one distribution from another. So a simple way of thinking is, it is a measure of how much the shapes differ. Are we together? KL divergence is a measure of how much the shapes differ. Now, KL divergence is asymmetric. So a symmetric version of it is called a JS divergence. It is just a KL divergence of AB plus KL divergence of BA half. That's what it is. So How's you, that spelled? K-A-L-E? No, or? no, no. Yeah, look at this word here. K, capital K, capital L. Oh, oh, I see it over there. Sorry. Yes, and JS divergence. That's what it is. Right? And now let's try. This is, it seems to have gotten stuck. What happens if just starting from scratch, we use a pre-trained model. Now we are going to do a different game. Right? We are going to start with a pre-trained model and see how fast this one can go and do its job. Uh, Let, let's go to another data set. I think there's a little bit of a bug here. Okay, we'll start with the pre-trained model. And a pre-trained model has pretty much already figured it out. So it doesn't take long for it to do that. So pre-training is again a sign of uh, the power of transfer learning. Do you see, if you look at the, if you look at the KL divergence graph here, and especially the JS divergence, which you should look at, it is having a pretty strong drop. So let me make it a bit bigger. On this, on this side, you'll see that it's continuously dropping and uh, it can get into a bit of a mess now, right? So this also refers to the fact that it's sometimes un unstable. Did you notice that now it's all over the place? Right. So then it will again converge after some time Right. So you have to watch out at what play, at, at which point you want to stop. Let's take a different distribution. You take a distribution like this, and you say, you notice that this is a ellipsoidal structure standing up like a flame, and this is like a circular structure. If you use a pre-trained one, let's see how far a pre-trained GAN can go. Something is preventing this site from making progress. Okay. I think you need to check um, generator. There's a box on the bottom. On the bottom, there is a box. Generator? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is okay. No, generator. Oh, right. 
generator and this, yes. Did I accidentally click on it and reset it? Okay, let's try this. Use a pre-trained model for this. Let's try this. All right, I don't know <clears throat> what I did to screw up, so I'll just refresh this page and do it again. All right, let's try this guy. And let's start it. Now, do you see how fake data is just in the beginning clustered at one point, and then it's sort of being stretched out. And if you look very carefully, you can see the you can literally see the way it's transforming the manifold from noise to this. And you remember we talked about those manifold transformations in Ola's paper reading on Sunday. It was our first paper reading. And so uh, we won't go too, too much into it, but you can clearly see that it's beginning to uh, fall in place. Right? Is there a KL divergence? Is that smoothing method? Come again. Kale divergence, is it for smoothing for the model? No, no, no. It's a measure. It's like entropy. It's literally okay. a cross entropy measure, very close to cross entropy. Okay. It's a measure of how much two things differ. The prediction and the reality differ if you if you want to have it that way. Okay. That's all it is. Okay, let's look at a circle now. Try a luck with the circle and see how it goes. And it's worth playing around with it. Uh, <clears throat> Do you see how those points have gotten scattered away from each other gradually? And there are regions in which it is not producing any points at all. And look at the discriminator, how the discriminator is deciding whether it's fake or real. The fake points it is, if you look where my mouse is, you can see that this is what the discriminator thinks and the generator is not trying to fool this. And so after a little while, it will become pretty close. Right? Now, the best part is you could do your own picture. You can go here and let's make a picture. my coffee mug of sorts. Well, this is a reasonably good coffee mug, I guess. Let's see what happens. So the point is, would you get fooled seeing data from the generator and say it could be real data coming from the actual thing? And just looking at this, you would agree that uh, this data, except for a few mistakes in the center, pretty much has the dots are placing themselves where the green dots are. Isn't it? Would you agree, guys? Most of this uh, pink or purple dots are placing themselves where the green dots are, in the vicinity of the green dots. So, well, that is it. That is it. And this is the last one I'd like to uh, try out and see uh, what happens. Do you notice it's not able to make up its mind? Repeatedly, it's
So do you think it will converge, guys? I think it will just sometime. It's not looking good. No. Yes. <laughs> It'll take really a long time or maybe never. No, yeah. I think it will come back and forth. Playing a baseball. Yeah. Remember I told you that one See of long that you can have it GAN is that it may zero in. It may, it, you know what happens is that it starts producing one, 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 because it figures, it has figured out how to produce one. Then the discriminator will try to distinguish between the ones. Once the discriminator succeeds, generator will abandon one and it will go to two, right? And then once the discriminator figures that out, then it will go to three, right? So uh, pretty much it's a cat and mouse game and it keeps happening. And you see that happening here in some sense. So with that, I hope this makes this whole thing quite real for you. I would encourage you to go play with this on your own. And uh, put your own data, visualize, draw your own figures and so forth. And this page, uh, can I please give it to you as reading material for this week? Yeah. Besides yes, talking about the GAN articles and so forth, also read this. It's a, it's a, uh, people have put in a lot of effort to create this site. It was a joint effort, I believe, between Georgia Tech and Google to produce this, or Facebook, I forget which one is too. I think Facebook or Google. Um, Google, it's a joint collaboration that produced this. So let's uh, give some time to it. So today, what will I do? I would like to show you a notebook. And this notebook, a GAN notebook, is actually something uh, I did not write from scratch. It is essentially taken from the PyTorch website itself. And uh, the re it, it is so well written that I didn't see uh, much that I could improve upon it. So I left it as that. So we'll go over this uh, carefully today. And I want you guys to do that. So before you run this notebook, what you'll have to do is, you'll have to follow one instruction. There is, if you want to run it locally on your machine, data, follow this. You go to this website and you go to this Google Drive. Right? If you go to this Google Drive, let us go there. I must warn you that it's a huge data file. Not too huge. It is about a little more than a gig, or one and a half gig or something. So it will take a bit of time to download. But do you see this? So of these files, get this guy. You see IMG align celebra, celebra? sorry, I uh, got it. This file guys, the third one, the one that has a download, uh, you know, link built to it. Download this file and unzip it on your machine in uh, whichever location that you like. Then what you have to do is come to your code and in the code, uh, we'll, we'll come to that code, but let me go to that uh, place a little early on. Do you see this? I put that value here in the third cell here. Is the code visible guys? Yes, sir. Awesome. So just put your uh, directory here and uh, then increase the number of workers based on how many, uh, how much GPU cores and so on and so forth that you have, right? So two is obviously meant for pretty underpowered machines, but you can make it more. So we'll, we'll, we'll carefully walk through this now. We, we know the theory of GAN, it's a cat and mouse game between the cop and the thief. So matplotlib, do we, by now, is this becoming very easy to remember? What is this line doing? Anybody remembers? Place the graph in the code. Yes, it just inlines the graphs. Then you don't need to do from future import print. This is for people who are using uh, Python 2.7. It's unnecessary. Uh, then the this is do you notice that these are all torch imports torch and torch vision and then numpy and so forth that's all it is they have deliberately seeded the random number generator so that you get reproducible results now there are a few uh, arguments or parameters you need to set data root is where your data will be how many workers you want a batch size yeah so because the DC GAN paper uses a batch size of 128, they're, they're sort of sticking to it. 
they're trying to reproduce the DC GAN paper exactly. Right? And this is one of the things we'll do, guys, as we move forward, we'll take the latest paper and we'll try to reproduce it in code. It's surprisingly easy to do that with PyTorch. So image size, here images are 64 by 64. Right? Number of color channels, there are three color channels. Right? So it is not monochrome and it is not a four channel image. NZ is the length of the latent vector, the underlying representation. We can ignore that. Depth of feature map. So these are things that are there in the DC GAN paper. I didn't go into that. But let's see the things that we do understand. Number of epochs, sorry. What does the number of epochs refer to, guys? How many times through the data you're going to go? Exactly. Each epoch to spin through the data. You're familiar with it. Learning rate. We are certainly very familiar with learning rate. A beta one, it is a hyperparameter of the Adam optimizer, right? And this number should be about half and so forth. And GPU is the number of GPUs available. Right? So if you set the number of GPU available to, let's say one, it means that you have one video card, two means two video card, and so forth. Why is that important, guys? Why is that you can important? take advantage of the graphical processing and unit. Otherwise, what will happen? Just CPU. Yes, otherwise, the so, whole learning will run very, very slow. So now let's go here and read this. This is uh, simply an image folder. Now, do we remember these data sets we produce using some code here? This, uh, this comes from Torch Vision Remit, in which you point out the image folder. And the, do we remember these uh, transformations? This one will ensure and resize the image to 64 by 64. It is just a precaution. This image already comes as 64 by 64. I suppose it's just a way to ensure that just in case it wasn't, and you are applying this code to some other, uh, uh, some other images that you have downloaded, they will get resized to 64 by 64. A center crop, what does center crop do guys? Remember we talked about it in the first session. You just take the center of it. You just leave a few pixels on the edges away. Then two tensor is obviously you want to convert it to tensor because that's what PyTorch uh, thinks of data as and normalize. Normalize all the values to have an average of 0 0.5, which again makes sense. You do that. And then after that, you create a data. So once you have the data set, this is PyTorch language. What do you do? You create a data loader to which you give the data set and the batch size. Shuffle is equal to true and number of workers. So why is shuffle true? What does shuffle true do, guys? Uh, the randomness. Yes. After every random. epoch, it will reshuffle the images right? so that uh, uh, the neural network is not catching on to specific patterns in the sequence. Now this line of code you all are familiar with if the GPU is there. Now plot some training images. What is it doing? It is just picking from the data loader uh, using the iterator and some images. You can do any which way. Like you could just say data uh, for epoch, just take one batch of data right? Uh, in that. But uh, here you're taking it and you're reducing the figures in an eight by eight grid. You're putting all these pictures. This is standard. Matplotlib. Now, now let's start implementing this DC GAN paper. So one of the things is uh, there is a particular way to initialize the weights. The, the, the paper says that it is better to initialize it with, no, uh, with, uh, with a normal distribution. Right. So this is not a, like, for example, people do all sorts of uh, initialization, Xavier initialization, this, that. But here they are saying, let us start with the normal distribution uh, as an initialization, and it has some benefits. And they say that the stand, these, you know, th this mostly comes by trial and error. They are saying that if you take a normal distribution with this sort of a zero, mean zero and standard deviation 0 0.2, it will work very well for you. So that's all it is, it's just initialization. Now let's look at the generator code. So the generator guys, what is the input to the generator? Do we remember? The random number. 
Yes, you just feed it noise, any kind of noise, any kind of random input. You can you can give it a linear random input. You can give it a, a normal random in, input. You can give it a binomial or whatever it is, log normal. It is your choice. You can feed it whatever random input, and it will produce an output which is now in this case. What is the output that it should produce? Images. Nice. Image. And what should be the size of that image? Eight into eight. 3 cross 64 cross 64, isn't it? 3 channels, 64 height, 64 width. So we are going to do that. Now, remember that the generator is very peculiar. It is the way we think of quantnet. It runs it backwards in some sense. So the way to read the transformer, uh, I mean the generator, is actually to read it backwards. Right. So you take this conf layer here. Right. So See, you see that in the, here, number of channels, 3 times 64 by 64 is being produced. It is being produced out of this, which is being produced out of this, which is being produced out of just a small 8 cross 8. And this is being produced out of 4 cross 4. And that itself is being produced by uh, noise that we will inject, which is being scattered into a, you know, it is being projected into a massive uh, number of filters, num number of channels, right? And so it's almost like you're running a convolutional network backwards. Remember that in typical con, your sizes decrease as you go from left to right, and uh, number of channels increase, right? So here is the opposite. Number of channels are high in the beginning, and as you go along, they keep on decreasing. Ultimately, you end, it, end with only three channels, but the size of the image keeps on increasing. So how does the generator work? You give it some input, right? And let's say and the conf transpose, uh, stuff like that. So it's not, there's nothing very specific. In it. And what is the forward? It just says forward is easy. You just apply the sequential thing to it. By the way, guys, you notice that this way of writing it, it is very uh, a Kira's way of writing things. In one long statement, it has weaved all of this forward. It is okay. I like it better laid out with a in it and a forward. Uh, but some people like it just like this. They like it to be declared uh, using the sequential because they like the Kira's syntax. So I think in the, somewhere in the code, you'll see I have given an example of the sequential also. Now, so now that we have defined the generator, let us see how do we generate. So what you do is, what are we doing here? Network G is the generator. You're instantiating a generator over those number of GPU, and then you're moving it to the device. Which device? The GPU. So now your generator will be loaded onto the GPU, right? And so, so on and so forth, right? And what if you have multiple GPUs? Uh, this is something I, I didn't teach you, but maybe this is a good occasion to introduce. If you have more than one GPU, the problem is to which GPU are you putting this device? What you do is you give it to the device and you say GPU, okay? but then you need to do a form of map reduce. Your batch will be broken up into a parallel uh, sub batches and they'll be fed into the different number of uh, GPUs and each GPU will work on a, you know, a fraction of a batch, a fraction of that mini batch. And then in the end, they will merge the results when you're computing the loss. So it's sort of a map reduce kind of a thinking. So that is it. So when you say data parallel, you're getting it ready to get into that mode. Right? And you apply the initialization weights, you know, weight initialization, if you remember. Uh, so you're just saying use these weights and print G. So when you print it, you notice something uh, very interesting. You start out with a convolution layer, which is uh, 100, so it is 512 channels which is a fairly massive number of channels. But as you go down at the end, what is the number of channels, guys? Three. Why is it only three at the end? Because we are trying to produce a three-dimensional, I mean, RGB image. 
the three channel color channels. Now, what about the discriminator? If we look at the discriminator, actually, it is in some sense the generator run backwards. And so you'll see that you notice, you just look at the last line here. Does this line look a lot like the first line of the generator? So you look at the first line of the generator. 8410 bias is equal to false, NGF times 844, right? And, and, and you look at the last line here. Yeah. NGF. Are we together, guys? Do you see that yes. in many ways, the, the same thing run backwards? Right? And uh, there are actually, there are a small bunch of subtleties you use uh, because it's cons, you do batch norm 2D typically. And then uh, the, uh, there's another subtlety here. Look, in the generator, you get away by using relu. It will give you speed. But in the, generally in the, in the discriminator, this is a bit of a subtlety, you tend to keep it as leaky relu. What's the, what's the difference between leaky relu and relu? Anyone, guys? Oh, when it's a negative, it's a not Yes, just but zero. it doesn't disappear. It allows a negative you value. You have a negative. small gradient. That's a point. That's, that's all it is. And the reason you do that is at the end of it, then you give it a sigmoid. Why in the world are we putting sigmoid at the end of the discriminator? You just wanted to do a Boolean classification? It's exactly. a classification. Exactly. Yeah. So if we go back to that picture that we had, uh, where did that thing go? Uh, oh, I got rid of it. Let's go back to that image and see that again. Again, uh, this is a small uh, diversion here, but let's do that. Um, where did it open up? DC can. So I can close this now. This now. YouTube and Ganda. Okay, so when you go to the GAN lab, do you notice that the discriminator is either saying it's real or it's saying it's fake? Isn't it? That's all it is. Huh? So uh, with that in mind, let's now go back to the DC GAN. We understand that for binary classification, a sigmoid is quite effective. You don't need multiple uh, nodes. There. So now what do we do? You create, now that you create the discriminator, you go and instantiate the discriminator. This code is exactly the same as for the generator. So do you notice that guys, if you really think about it, it's a very, uh, very interesting idea. You take approximately the mirror image of a convolutional net. You take a convolutional net for classification and you call it the discriminator, just as you would. I mean, imagine that you have a convolutional net for classification and then you do something interesting. You, you invert the convolutional net almost, you do a lateral inversion, and you uh, use that to generate an image, a fake image. And then, so now into the classifier, you feed both real and fake images, and you try to train the generator. That is the whole game. Once you get used to it, it looks very simple. But uh, it takes a little bit of a time to get used to it, which is why I started with code that actually works. And the thing is, uh, this has some exercises at the end of it. I made sure that those exercises are easy to do and really worth doing. Okay. So uh, here we go. We set it up. This is the whole theory of the loss function uh, associated with this. So you guys will all remember that the, across, the binary cross entropy loss is this, right? Uh, y n minus, in our language, we don't call it x n, we call it uh, y hat. y log y hat plus one minus y times log one minus y hat. It, that is how I would write in the language in which we are used to or the way I've taught you. Initialize the BC. Uh, BC stands for a binary cross entropy. In other words, the entropy that we are used to. So you do that. Now, do you notice that they're using two different optimizers, one for the discriminator and one for the 
generator, why is it a good idea to use two, uh, two optimizers? Uh, because one should hold the parameters of the discriminator and one should be bound to, one should work on the parameters of the generator. And you don't want to mix the, these two up, isn't it guys? You don't want to use one and the same generator in one in the I mean both for generator and discriminator that wouldn't be very good. If if nothing else, the number of parameters are different. Right? A generator architecture theoretically could be very different from a uh, from a, uh, this discriminator architecture. So you use two of them. With that, it is straightforward now. Training loop is interesting. See, the magic of GAN is not in creating two neural networks, but it is in the training loop. So let's look at the training loop a little bit more carefully. When we look at this training loop, you run for a certain number of epochs. And by the way, guys, uh, I must warn you that when you do run on your machine, it takes a while to run. So uh, be beware. Let me see if it has finished running on my machine. Uh, probably it has. Yeah, it did. And it finished in 30 minutes, executed in 30 minutes, 31 seconds on, uh, on this laptop. But this laptop is no ordinary laptop. It is GPU powered. Uh, then, but if you run it on the workstation, it runs in about five, six minutes results. So here it is, the generator discriminator loss during this. So you can see that the discriminator, uh, uh, pretty much the police is always ahead of the cop, uh, ahead of the thief. Right? It will have much less loss than the generator because the generator, the thief, is just trying to guess what the police is thinking. The police, of course, is, has an advantage. It's trying to, uh, it is really trying to distinguish between the real and the fake. So for that reason, you'll, you'll see this common pattern with GANs. Right? The losses of the thief will always be a little bit more than the police. And uh, I suppose that's true for real life too, because there's a saying in law enforcement, all thieves eventually get caught. So something like that. So how do you visualize the G in progress? So when you do this, you can see this, all sorts of uh, animation here. Let me do that. Uh, well, it will execute and it will show, well, this isn't a very good. Yeah, let, let's play this. Where am I? Loop. Or once. Okay, let's go. Uh, yeah, do you notice, guys, that the faces, how it is, how the generator is trying to come up with better and better faces, more realistic faces? I don't know if you can make out from there, yeah. but the faces are significantly improving. And after a little while, it becomes a little hard to tell. For example, this face, uh, this face of this uh, pretty girl here. To me, it looks fairly realistic. It could easily fool us into believing this is real. Likewise, the, fa the face of this uh, very scholarly person, whosoever it is, it, it all begins to look pretty real. And here is, all of these begin to look pretty real. Now, this is, we haven't trained it enough. We have trained it only for a limited number of epochs. When you train it for more epochs, or you use a bigger network, Remember, we used this code is using a network that you can uh, fairly easily train on your laptops. But if you really want to play with it, increase the number of layers, do funny things. That is literally your homework. Now, let's compare. Let's take a batch of real images and a batch of fake images and see how it goes. Between the two groups, you can see the real images and the fake images. Uh, I don't know if you can easily tell the difference. I think it's pretty hard, isn't it? Some pictures are easy. Maybe this one was a bit easy to tell. It's fake. This one is a bit easy to tell. Some of them, you can see the edges are blurry and so forth. <coughs> right? Do you see that if you look very carefully at the edge, you'll see blurriness. One easy way to catch fake is look at, look at this. And the general resolution of the image, real images tend to have higher resolution. Now, what do you do after that? Now, think about it. What happens if you train it for much longer? And then uh, change the model architecture. It is very hard to get a lot of images 
because uh, I mean, you can try different image data sets, but generally uh, images are a bit of a hard thing to get. Um, so instead, I would suggest, especially because with human faces, there is this model release. You need permission to take or gather a lot of photographs of people. So um, the best that you can do is uh, you can change the architecture of this congelation lens, both of them. Uh, play around with it, guys. So for example, what happens if you deliberately uh, try to simplify the cop, simplify the discriminator, remove a few layers from it, con layers from it. Try that, see, see if that helps. Right? And obviously run it for more epochs. Play with the learning rate, see what the learning rate does. It doesn't mention it here, but play with the learning rate. Mm, I I so. Yes. I have a question that, so how come it matches the, you know, the shading in the picture, the uh, illumination, all these things, it, it seems, uh, you know, so uh, uh, kind of impossible how it does it all this. Yeah, see, the, that's the thing about computers. They're just absolutely blind. But to them, it is just a mathematical vector of numbers. And it is trying to fake that vector. To it, it's just a sequence of numbers, isn't it? One dimensional vector, ultimately. Okay. Can you go over the training loop again? Yes, I'll go over the training loop. Um, that's the long one and that's the one that we'll go over Th this one i'll go over in a bit guys hold on huh? but before i do that uh, let me just show you that uh, the results are sufficiently impressive now one more thing you can generate music not just images so if you go here and i want to go here for a moment and uh, let me share the sound uh, where am i share computer sound I think the fake ones are seeming more realistic in the images. Yes, that's what it is. Yeah. That's the day these days. The state of the art is way ahead. DC GAN is now old technology. So do you notice this way? The, it can generate all sorts of sounds it can produce and it can imitate. So for example, English, here it is. Uh, Let's see how, how well. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. And then? Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770 to 1850. Yes. So can you tell which of these two is real and which is fake? I'll play this again. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770 to 1850. Second one is fake. <laughs> Second one is <laughs> yeah, a little bit is nonsensical. Is it obvious that it's fake? Uh, no, not exactly. Not at all, right? And then yeah, if you weren't paying close attention. Yes. Ending was slightly weird. Like, mm. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. So this is from a different text. Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770 to 1850. Let's try a different one. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. So th these are using sort of different aspects of the game. Yeah. Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770 to 1850. And then you can, uh, not only can you do it in English, so just in case you thought it's just English, let's try something in Mandarin. Now let's listen to, oh, this one we can't listen to for some reason. Uh, I don't know what happened. So, all right, we'll try a different one. This is the real one. And now let's try this. Uh, this is the real one. And now let's try On casual observation, you would say it's the same person, isn't it? Right. This is yeah. it, guys. And so there are many, many samples, and you can uh, uh, play around with it. Even if you cook up words, it will, it will learn to imitate. So it also shows uh, you know, how powerful these GANs have become. So now that we know all about it, 
it certainly behooves us to go and try to understand the meat of the matter, which is the main training loop. Let's go look at it. So remember in the training loop, what did I say? In one epoch, what you do is, and for each step, what you do is you train the, uh, the discriminant first, you give the cop an advantage. By the way, it doesn't, I don't think it makes that much of a difference, but you give the discriminant, you train the, discri the, uh, uh, the discriminator first. The, uh, let me just use the word cop. You train the cop first. So that when you do that, you do a gradient descent only on the cop, only on the discriminator. Don't <coughs> do the, that. So let's read that. This is the net D. What was net D, guys? It was the Adam optimizer associated with the discriminator, with the cop. So you, why do we do zero grad? By now, you must be familiar with this code. Whenever we do the training loop, we always zero grad or uh, uh, reset the gradient. Zero, exactly. This is just pushing it onto the, uh, to the CPU and all of that. I, I wouldn't do that. Let's not worry about that. At the end of it, what you get is this is to do with the fact that you know you have multiple GPUs and so on and so forth. So a little bit of a twiddling uh, with the code, but uh, we can gloss over it. It doesn't do uh, anything special. It just sort of breaks it up onto the CPU, GPUs. A forward pass, how do we do the forward pass? So remember, net D was your network. Do you remember, guys, that net D was the, the variable, net D was the network. Look at this, the discriminant network. Are we together? And net G is the generative network. These are the variables this programmer has used. So uh, remember that net D is the, is the cop, net G is the thief. So net G makes the prediction here. Yeah, net D makes the prediction. The cop makes the prediction and it produces an output. Right? Uh, What does minus one stand for? It says as many, whatever the batch sizes respect that, right? Get us a view, a single dimensional view with minus, with whatever number of columns there are, there are. Right? Calculate the loss on each. So here it is, we calculate the loss on the output in the label. Now, uh, just something to be aware of is it's always better, don't put label and output, always put output and label, right? So you put Y hat Y. If you remember in scikit-learn, traditionally, we, it doesn't matter, but by convention, uh, at least I used to do y, y hat. Right? So here, you have to remember to do output and label. Output is your y hat, of course, in the language that we were used to. So now that we have computed the output, what is the next thing we should do? What is the criteria doing? Is doing the, it is a loss function, right? It is a binary cross entropy loss. You get the loss. Now, what do you do with the loss now? You need to back propagate the loss. Are we together, guys? So all the gradients will get, of whose? All the gradients of the cops will be updated. Weight gradients. So that cops neural network is primed to make a gradient descent step. Right? And that is exactly what you do backward. That is what you will do at the very end. So you have all of these gradients, then you get output, mean, item, you figure out what it is. Now you move forward. Once you have trained it with real data, all real batch, now what you do is you say, all right, I train with all fake batch. How do you get fake data? You can go to the generator and get a lot of fake data from it. The thief will produce you as many counterfeits as you want. So it's very simple. What do you feed to the thief? What do you feed to the generator? You're feeding random noise. In fact, uh, random normal noise. Uh, rand N will produce a bell curve, like you know, the noise from a bell curve, data from a bell curve. Right? It doesn't matter whether you feed it random or random normal or log normal or whatever. The point is it should be random of some kind. Right? So it doesn't terribly matter which kind. You do that. And now what do you do? If you feed random noise into the generator, what will it come out with? It will come out with an image. Would you agree? It will basically come out with an image? Yeah. Yes. And so what we do, and now oh, here's the thing. The, when you're training the cop, you're being honest. When you 
to give this data that the thief has produced to the cop, you tell the cop that this is fake, right? So you, the label that you give to that data, when you give it to the cop is you say, this is all fake. In other words, zero, let's say, right? And then you let the cop do its prediction. But before you do it, there is, do you notice that there is one crucial line here, fake dot detach. Why are we detaching the output from the generator? Uh, it's a technicality. The reason you do that is uh, that if you that tensor is associated with the generator network, neural network, thief neural network. Yeah, we don't want to do the back. We don't want to calculate the yeah. gradient on that. Exactly. You have to be careful. Otherwise, you might end up uh, giving the thief a hint. So you want to detach it. And then once you detach the same thing, minus one will make it into a column vector of results because ultimately you're just doing sigmoid. All you want is the probability for each uh, input. There is a probability, right? That you are uh, producing. Well, no, sorry. Uh, the net D will produce a probability that this is a real or a fake. And then, so you have an error now in those predictions again, over the false images, the cop will have certain number of errors. And even that <coughs> you used to back, when you do error D dot back, uh, who, is, who is learning from this step? Who is going to learn from this step? Uh, yeah. These gradients? The discriminator. The cop, yes. Uh, the cop. The discriminator. Yeah. Exactly. And so now you have a total error, which is the error coming from the real data and the fake data. And then both of these errors are together. Right? the total error D. And now you ask the optimizer to actually take a step, which optimizer, the, the cop optimizer, to actually take a gradient descent step. So at, by the time the execution reaches line 48, you have taken one step of learning, one mini batch of learning for the cop, isn't it? But the thief hasn't learned anything. So now you move on to the thief. So let's move on to the thief. Ah, this line, net G is the theme. This line looks familiar, net G got zero grad down. No, why did you say one mini batch? Because see, it is wrapped in an outer circle for I data. This is a batch of data no? for each batch or the okay. technical word is mini batch, but you use the word batch. Means your batch size will be 128 images, that's all. Okay. Out of millions of images, only 128 images. Okay, yeah. That's it, it's a small batch. And so the, you are inside a double for loop for a uh, for given an epoch, given a mini batch, you are doing one step of learning for the uh, for the cop and one step of learning for the thief. Uh, so you just just count the step function, this function step, right? This is your gradient descent function and see that it is inside a double for loop. Yeah. And that gives you a clue of what's happening. So that, yes. Uh, so in the fake dot detach, that that line is crucial because you don't want the the thief, yes, the, the generator, to to yes. have adjustable weights when you pass the forward and back yes. prop. Okay, that is it. That is a crucial thing. And so now what happens is, uh, training this guy is actually much easier, right? Training the G network. What do you do? You give it some <coughs> the thief some data, you fill it with real label. Like you pretend when you, when, when you have to train the thief, what you do is you, a successful thief will produce a counterfeit and claim that it is real, isn't it? So uh, this is what you do. When you fill the labels for it, you give it real labels. <laughs> real label means one, you say it is real, uh, it is real uh, data, uh, real data. And then it will give it to the cop and it will f uh, try to fool the cop. Now it will look at the output that the, that the cop that the uh, cop produces, and it will use the loss function between the. This is your loss function, the output in there. This is the loss function produced by who? This is the loss function still produced by the cop, <coughs> right? It is the cop who is learning. I mean, sorry, who who's, who 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 is the ultimate arbiter? So you see how many mistakes that cop make. And based on that mistake, you do a back, back propagation in the thief and you take a one gradient descent step for the thief. And that is it. That makes one 
cycle or one step of learning. And then every 50 rows, this part you must be familiar with guys now, right? Every 50 rows just produce some statistics, right? Asif, uh, one question. Uh -huh. uh, at that day you said that uh, during when the uh, generator uh, feeds in data, the discriminator doesn't learn, right? Are we uh, yeah, yeah. doing so, that here? Yeah, yeah. See, what happens is that this step is two steps. The first step is where, if you notice, right, only the discriminator is making a step. So only the discriminator is learning, right? See, unless you call the step on, the, on a thing, it won't learn. So part A, the, the discriminator learns. And now look at part B. In this case, no. do you notice that the, uh, it would have learned if right here, right after this, I had also said optimizer D dot step. No, we are not doing that. Right? Okay. So, uh, so where the, does the discriminator get its uh, fake data from? Oh, it uh, gets it generator, from the generator. So let's go over that again. Huh? No, See, no, no. Uh, because generator is going to claim that everything is true, right? It will always claim everything is true. So then where does the discriminator get, get the labeled fake data? Okay, so let me, let me uh, maybe this is time that we explain it with a little bit of a, uh, let me go there. Workshop. It calls for a new page, I suppose. Uh, or maybe at the end of this GAN, let me explain this. And uh, this is perhaps good review. So see, here's the thing. This is the thief. This is actual data, right? The pile of truth. Now what happens is that this cop discriminator, it doesn't know where the data is coming from. Right? All it knows is it is just a simple classifier that is fed X, Y, a batch of capital X and the labels, right? Data labels. labels. And it produces an answer. Either it will say that this is real or it will say it's fake, right? Or usually more commonly as one zero or something like that. It will, it will choose between one of these two. So this is a basic architecture. Now the question is how do we connect the dots? So the way we connect the dots is, now I'll redraw this picture in the two steps. First the step in which the, the cop is learning. So let me use this color to say that the cop is learning. No, this is terrible. Maybe I'll use this. Data. So you take, let, let's take a mini batch of 128 images. Right? So you create X real. And of course, the label will always say one. Would you agree? A column vector of ones. One, 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 one. Right? Mm -hmm. Then what you do is you take this generator. And from generator, you produce again 128 fakes. And once again, you will have X fake. And this time around, 0, 0, 0, 0, zeros, right? This is the data that you have. So now what you do is you go to the, you go to the discriminator. You first pass this data. Number one, pass real data data right and so it will take a real data it will produce a real law it will produce a y hat real right and so from y hat real you'll get a loss real right and from loss real you wait there you don't you don't do anything further then you go you 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 pass in now the fake data this data also goes in step number two fake data. But the, you know, this time you're being honest with the police when the police is learning. So the cop is learning. So once again, this will produce the Y hat, the fake, the, the predictions on the fake data. And so it will lead to its own fake loss. Right. So now once you have the loss, what do you do on the losses? On the losses, you say backward. So all the gradients will backwards. So all the gradients will get computed. Right. 
and the gradients will accumulate from these two losses, like if you're doing them together. And then what happens is now that the gradients have accumulated, now is the great time to take this network D and D dot step. So when you do D dot step, remember that G has not learned at this stage. A D has learned something. So far, so good, Chandra? Yeah, yeah, I, I got it. I got what I think now I understood. Okay. So I, I was not realizing that there is a step where you have only zeros going in. Yes. And so let me complete this story uh, in, in case some other people will benefit. So this is the step when, when COP learns. This is it. Now, what does it look like when the thief learns? The same thing. When the thief learns, you play a different game when thief learns. Thief is blind. Thief has never seen the data. So the architecture is very simple at that particular moment. You generate, let's say, 128 fakes. But what you will do is you will produce the image, but you will claim that these are all real because that's what thieves do. Right? So you will send this as real data and you will feed it into the police. D, right? So now you're fooling the cop. So what do you want to see? You want to see uh, how well you fooled it, right? So the, the answer that you hope the cop will give so is close to one, to one. So when you are beginning to win, when the thief is beginning to do well, it will produce an answer closer to one. But if it produces an answer closer to zero, you know that <coughs> you are screwed. I mean, you need to, you'll get caught. So what happens is you pass this, but with ones. And notice the difference that you're passing it this time with ones and not zeros. So once again, this is a, a, once a, it will only produce the y hat fix that will lead to a loss function. The D. Now what you do is you take that loss, right? And once you have that loss, you call the the you call the backwards here. Uh, here. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, the, the loss that you are doing is you compare it to this guy, right? And then you come up with your loss. And once you have your loss, the rest of it is simple. You call the backwards. And then you call the net D, G dot step. And now both the cop and the thief have taken a step. Okay? So that is essentially it. There, there isn't uh, anything else. Yeah, so, I got it. Uh, Asif, can you go back there? I think this was the question that I was asking yes, uh, on Monday. Yes. And I think we, we kind of reasoned it saying that the loss has to be propagated through D because that it's only understood at that sigmoid. In the original paper, yes. Uh, in, in the original paper, uh, we did that. But now what is what we are doing is, so DC Gans and all of these people, what they do is because the output is so like the output here of these is just a label here. We, we are just producing true false, like, you know, probability, right? And you have a number here as a fake or real. So you feed directly into it. You don't need to actually, uh, you take the loss directly. You don't go through this. So, okay. So essentially you're not passing, you're not doing a back propagation through D you're essentially taking yes. the- You're the taking the loss and you're directly going to G and updating G. Okay. So this is it. This is all that you're doing here. So uh, then, and you see this here. Uh, by the way, this is also in this figure, if you look at this. So later on, you know, there's always you know, refinements and improvements and so forth. So you look at this. Your, your generator loss, you're feeding it directly into this and getting an update. You're getting the gradients and you're getting the updates. Whereas when the discriminator loss, you're feeding it in here and improving this, the discriminator. So two-step process. Okay. So this is it, guys. So the rest of it, now you realize, is very straightforward. So uh, just some bookkeeping. And thus we come to the end of a complicated training loop which is non-intuitive, you know, this is not a code you will understand unless you know GANs. Asif. Yes. Uh, just one more minute. Can we go to the loss function plotting, which you have done over here? Loss uh, the function plotting that uh, came out of that uh, lab? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Uh, no, back in the code itself. Come again? Uh, back in the code itself. There's this graph which you have plotted for the loss function. Oh, one second. Uh, where, oh, where did the notebook disappear? The third one, yeah, the fourth one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, at the bottom, yes. Yeah. Results of the log. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, Asif, shouldn't be the loss function for discriminator be decreasing and for the generator be increasing because initially the discriminator was getting the crap data from the generator, but then the generator starts learning and produces like, you know, the proper uh, Copy, uh, copy things, if you can say. And yeah. Now you see that. See, what happens is generator always learns better than the, I mean, sorry, the discriminator always learns better than the generator. Right? The cop learns because better. Generator has one, see, the discriminator has one advantage. At least half the time it's seeing the real data. Okay. Isn't it? Whereas the discriminator, the generator, never gets to see the real data. So uh, think about it this way. Suppose that uh, all the, you're trying to tell whether the fruit is uh, real or not. And one of the column attributes is the color of the fruit. And you know we are talking about apples, so it will be somewhere between green and red. But the generator, the thief doesn't know, so he's producing continuously fruits like uh, pink, purple, brown, black, whatnot. Gradually, it figures out that something greenish and something reddish will do, right? But no matter what you do, the loss function, the net loss of the discriminator tends to be lower than the net loss of the generator. Simply because, see, the generator is deforming noise into this, into this output. Okay. That's that. And so that is that, guys. And can you believe that what we do as simple mathematics, just with a few matrices, just basic vectors and matrices is all we are talking about in basic matrix multiplication and matrix calculus, leads to such wonderful results. Right? Let's play this training loop all over again and see what happens. Sorry, what is happening here? Uh, let me, why is it not running? Real versus fake, where do we go? No, uh, I would like to run this again. Yeah, so now we do this. Asif, did you notice they had Asim Premji as one of the pictures? Oh, it did. The beginning, the original <laughs> data set. The third picture on top was Asim Premji. Oh, interesting. So that is today's lab, guys. That's all I have for today. I. Um, I deliberately wanted to keep it a little bit brief so that I uh, walk through what we have covered. Now, uh, I see this GAN, the training loop, the, the rest of it is easy. By the way, you don't have to use a fully fried DC GAN. So I'll post some simpler examples. I feel that this code is very good. Uh, by the way, where is this code? Let me first show you where this code is. So this code I did not write. Uh, this code comes from the PyTorch tutorial. PyTorch, uh, if you just do GAN tutorial, it will come up, is the thing, eh? PyTorch. It's on the PyTorch website. So this is this. It looks much better here. This is it. So how do you uh, bring it into your notebook? All you have to do is, do you see this thing here? Shortcuts to it, right? Download to notebook, download to GitHub. Uh, view on GitHub, download to notebook, run in, if you have a Google Colab account, just directly, of course, click here. But the only thing to remember is when you do this, so let me do this. When you do this, do not forget one crucial step. What is that step, guys? Uh, the data. Yes, do not please forget to download the data. Otherwise, you'll keep scratching your head on why it's not working. 
So you must follow this step of downloading the data. And if you want to see what this architecture is, uh, so in this main thing, uh, there's a nice visual image of the architecture. Yeah, this is it. So uh, do you notice that this looks, uh, the CNNs as we are used to, it's running backwards. You take a random input of a random number of thousand, thousand, I mean, hundred size vector, hundred dimensional vector. You project it, look into how many channels you project. You project into four by four and a thousand twenty four channels. That's a whole lot of channels. And then you start decreasing 512, 256, 128, and finally only 64 channels. I mean, 64 by 64, but the number of channels keeps decreasing. Uh, uh, keeps decreasing, uh, 128, and then finally uh, three, and the image size keeps increasing. The image size went from four, eight, 16, 32, 64, whereas number of channels kept, kept on collapsing. Okay? Because at the end of it, you have to come up with something, some random vector. You have to morph this through some process into a 64 by 64 by three. Okay? And that's what you do. Then this is it. And so uh, going back to Colab, remember that, um, remember to do this. Make sure you download the data. That's all it is. So guys, I'd like to take a 10 minutes break and then let's come back and let's wind down this course. Huh? Let's see what we learned and didn't learn. And what's the road ahead? Any questions? No. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, one more statement I'd like to make. Uh, see, guys, this GAN is good. It's a very good, but it's a little bit intimidating because it's a, I mean, I explained the code to you, uh, but perhaps it's a little bit intimidating. So I have been in the pursuit of the simplest GAN one can write. Uh, I will post a couple of simple examples, right? some very basic examples. For example, uh, uh, suppose I uh, produce a GAN that, produ that only produces... Uh, let's say numbers between 10 and 20. Like, you know, the real data is any number, any floating point number between 10 and 20. So can a, can a generator catch on to that trick? Things like that. But the, we can do actually all of that uh, with a very simple, we just uh, see the discriminator is just a classifier. So nothing prevents us from just putting a single logistic unit there, one neuron, one layer, one neuron, as simple as that. Right? And likewise, you can keep your generator to be just one hidden layer right? and produce a, to produce a number. And nothing prevents us from doing that. Surprising thing is that itself will learn. And I feel that uh, somehow uh, most of the examples of GANs on the internet, they tend to um, be more leaning towards real life examples, which is very good, but perhaps a little bit intimidating when you're learning it for the first time. So I'll post some simple examples. Are you good? Um, Asif, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, in this lab, uh, when we are uh, training the, the COP uh, mechanism, we, we said uh, we will take a mini batch of um, real um, and then mini batch of um, fake. fake. But, but uh, when we were studying the um, theory on Monday, we talked about a mini batch of half and half. Yeah, yeah, that is it. So how do you make half and half? If I take 128 images, let's say mini batch size is 128, I take 128 real and 128 fake and pass it through, what, what, what do I get? Half and half, right? Okay, That's it. So, so, but in this case, when we look at the program, it is sequentially running, so. Oh, yes, yes. So in other words, the, the thing that you're concerned about is when we, we did not mix it up. Correct. But mixing doesn't help you. The reason is that at this particular moment, we are, we are just doing matrix multiplication, right? And the order in which you pass this data through the network in the forward direction really doesn't matter. Because remember, it's not learning from that order. The order, uh, it is not that, uh, you know, uh, see, it would be trouble if we said, uh, here is 128 uh, real data, learn from it. 
So then the cop would say, okay, I, le I learned something from it. Now here is 128 fake data and learn from it. Because the moment you learn, your weights change. But if you don't learn, your weights don't change. So then it, it doesn't matter. You, you can mix them up or you can give them in whichever order you like. It, it simply doesn't matter. Because at the end of it, what you'll end up with is loss, a number. There will be a number, let's say 47, coming from the mistakes you made in the real data. And maybe there's another number, 56, coming from the mistakes you made in the fake data. Yeah. The loss is essentially a marks you get in the exam. The cop is getting in the exam. Right. So in what order you feed in the numbers, will they added there, but you'll still come to the same numbers added up, the total of the two. Right, okay, understood. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So, uh, all right, so I'll post a few examples and maybe I'll create some more, uh, I'll give some more homeworks associated with those examples. Uh, in case this code, I mean, I personally feel that first time you encounter a GAN, uh, most of the GAN examples on the internet are rather com complicated. And I was sitting and writing it. I didn't finish it. I was hoping I'd finish it before this class. So I would have started you guys with that very simple example. It just occurred to me very late that uh, why start with DC GAN when I can start with a very primitive GAN, a one node classifier and just a single hidden layer as a generator. And it, it works, of course. It completely conforms to the theory. And so in principle, it completely works. So I'll post that code. And I'll also post detailed notes in the notebook for that code. So guys, what do we need to do? What we need to do here is do these things, guys. Run it for more epochs. See what happens. All right. Uh, then you can, and one more thing that you couldn't do here is that uh, you couldn't do the vector part, like, you know, uh, man with glasses minus this. So there are labels there in the data. You can search for those labels. They will find a few labels with man with glasses. And you can try out that man with glasses minus just man, and then plus woman, and then so forth. So it's a little bit trickier because now you have to come up with the latent vectors out of it. It's there. But uh, maybe that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, the code is there, guys. Huh? Uh, one of the sites that I want to show you guys that's very useful is, uh, uh, I don't know if you noticed that, it is there in your class resources, which is uh, somewhere at the bottom are the resources, isn't it? Uh, okay, let me go and search for resources. Important resources. Uh, yeah, useful resources. So if you look here, there's a lot of very useful resources I have, guys. And one of the sites that you will find is a paper with code. It is actually quite an influential site, paper with code. And I would encourage you to go there. It contains all the trending research, what is latest and greatest and so forth. Literally, it has those words, latest and greatest, right? So, uh, <clears throat> for example, all the landmark things, scikit-learn, you would, nobody would argue that this is a very influential project. TensorFlow, right? Uh, models, auto-differentiation, PyTorch, transformers, they are all here. More than that, what is trending at this moment? <coughs> here we go. How do you train a GAN with limited data? Do you notice that almost all the time, half the things are talking about GANs or they're talking about transformers. So look at this, this is GAN. What is this about transformer, isn't it? Okay. Then Google landmark recognition 2020 third place solution. Okay, uh, this is it. Then, oh, once again, style GAN, right? Uh, then so on and so forth. You can go, this will be about transfer learning, texture synthesis, transformers, and so forth. So you can go and read the important papers that are emerging. For example, this paper, which is a number three from the top, one of these days I'll cover. I think multiple of you have pointed out that we should cover this paper. It certainly is worth covering. But the beautiful thing with these papers is 
this site will only host a paper if the code is available. So you can just go straight to the code. Do you see the code is right here? Right. And you can go and read the code. The different implementations that people have provided. Somebody has provided a PyTorch implementation already of the research paper. Means you don't have to wait. You can just right away. You see a research that you like. You can right away start using it. And that is how open and uh, collaborative and vibrant the AI community is. It's very vibrant. People put in a lot of effort to quickly go implement it and then post it and so forth. So please do use that. Mm -hmm.